Well, hello, friends. Um, today we're going to go on another code tour, uh, and today it's going to be about um, the GUI, or the Windows Server, rather, because um, some people have asked me if I could do a tour of that. So um, we're going to just look at the startup first here to see. Um, as you can tell, uh, Serenity boots up into graphical mode, and um, it's possible to boot it in a text mode if you run um, with some different startup parameters, and um, you can you can run it this way too. But by default, we boot into graphics mode because it's a graphical operating system, right? So the text mode is just for debugging, um, and the um, we currently have two display drivers, and um, we have the um, support for the QEMU, like the virtual graphics card the QEMU uses, which is also the same as VirtualBox and um, this other emulator called Box. And um, we have a driver for that, but then there's also a generic driver that um, uses the multi-boot bootloader protocol. And if you're using the multi-boot driver, then we rely on the bootloader to set the correct video mode for us. And if you install Serenity on real hardware, then that's the thing that we're using. So um, that's set up here in the, um, here is our little boot header in the kernel. And uh, we set this uh, multi-boot flags here. We say that we want to request a video mode and here's the specific video mode that we ask the bootloader to set for us. So um, the presence of this header in our kernel means that the bootloader will find this and say, okay, I can set that mode for you. And then when we boot up, we're already in this mode. And then the bootloader um, passes, um, passes the address of the memory, like the video memory is passed to us in this multi-boot info data structure. And um, this is defined here. It's multi-boot info. This, this is just um, copied from the multi-boot spec, basically. What is it? Zero six, something like that. Yeah. Multi boot info. Uh, where's the start? Here. So this this guy right here um, has various things that the bootloader passes to the kernel, and um, here is the stuff that we are interested in. under the video section. We have the frame buffer address, pitch, width, and height, and the bits per pixel. And so um, the address is the, the most important part, I guess, which that tells us the physical memory address of the um, display frame buffer. So here is like where the pixels are literally stored in memory. And then this pitch tells us uh, how many bytes is uh, one row of pixels. And then these are the dimensions of the, of the um, display. So actually, you need all of these. <laughs> um, but, but the address is the most interesting one. So um, depending on which display driver we end up using, I can show you the multi-boot display driver. Um, or let me show you where we create that, actually. So this is created during uh, init, so like very early in boot. Um, if you have text mode enabled, then we don't try to create a frame buffer. Otherwise, we see, do we have multi-boot info with a frame buffer, um, either of type 1 or 2? We could probably actually uh, put something like this there instead, but right now it just says hard coded one or two. If so, then we create an MB uh, VGA device. This is just a um, multi boot VGA device basically. And we pass in the um, physical address of the frame buffer. And frame buffer, by the way, that means it just means like the, the memory buffer containing the pixel data. So we pass in all of the frame buffer metadata that we got from the bootloader. Um, but if we don't have multi-boot data, then we are probably booting in an emulator, uh, or at least without a bootloader somehow. Uh, and then we create this other thing called a BXVGA device. And I don't know exactly why I named it this way, I just kind of did. Um, it was originally a box VGA device, because I was testing with a box emulator. But then I switched to using QEMU, but this name kind of stayed. Um, and this one, uh, we don't have anything to pass it, so it has to discover on its own. So if you construct one of these, if you look in the constructor, um, then it will assign its frame buffer address 
based on the return value from this thing called find frame buffer address. And if we look at that function, uh, what that does is that it will uh, walk the PCI bus looking for a compatible um, like emulated VGA card, basically. So either this PCI ID or this PCI ID. So we just walk the entire PCI bus. If we find one of these, then we get the um, bar zero um, register from the, um, from the PCI. What is, what is it called? From the, from the PCI card, I guess. Um, and that register contains the frame buffer address. And um, that's how that's set up. And then there are various ways that we can set registers. But this is, this is all emulated. So this is not relevant for real hardware. This is only relevant in the emulator. Um, so we have, when we have this thing called set resolution here, which we can call, which allows us to set any resolution that we like. Um, and we're just setting various registers in the emulated video card to facilitate that. Um, when it comes to the multi-boot VGA device, then we don't have an implementation of set resolution. So if you call the set res resolution iocuddle on a multi-boot VGA device, then we'll save it, but we can't do much with it because we don't know how to tell the, the physical video card to actually change the resolution. Uh, that's something that has to be implemented, but we haven't done that yet. Um, so. That's basically how, how we get set up. So um, now, I guess, now we're, in, now we're in the stage of the boot where we have constructed a frame buffer device, but there's nothing on screen yet. We are in the video mode that we want. Um, if it's a multi-boot VGA device, if it's a BX VGA device, then we still haven't switched the mode. But then after this, the kernel doesn't really do anything else. Uh, it just continues with booting. And nothing else will happen with the um, display until we actually start this Windows Server process. So if you look in Windows Server main, um, the, um, let's see. So we read our config file, and we fetch the screen width and the screen height. This is where we get the resolution that we want. Um, and uh, we will instantiate a compositor and uh, a window manager. But I think it's here when we create the WS screen, the Windows Server screen. Let's look in his constructor. Right, so here's the, um, the big thing that happens now. We open this file called devfb0. <clears throat> That's frame buffer zero. And <clears throat> if we look in, um, let me show you. So here's that file. <clears throat> Now this is a magical device file that is provided by, <coughs> excuse me, provided by either the BXVGA device or the MBVGA device in the kernel. So you see that it has um, major number 29, minor number uh, 0. Um, let's see if we can, <coughs> yeah, right, 29, 0. And if we look in MBVGA device, we can see that it is a block device, 29, 0. And if we look in BXVGA device, we should see the same thing. Yeah, so they both provide the same um, device. Um, so you'll have either one of those providing the um, uh, device backend for dev FB0. And um, that happens through the regular file system mechanisms of, um, of like mapping file nodes to devices in the kernel. Uh, because when you open a file in Serenity, uh, we check, before we like try to read the file, we'll check, hey, is this a device file? If so, we'll give you back a special uh, file descriptor that has an internal link to uh, the device in the kernel rather than a link to the file on disk. So just to quickly show you that, when you get a file descriptor back from the kernel, it is um, an index into a table with these things, file description. And a file description can contain any kind of uh, file. And file is a um, is the base class of all the different things that you can open in the kernel. So it can be any one of these things. And an inode, shared memory, FIFO, device, which is the one we have, but it can also be a DTY and so on. Um, so in our case, it's going to be a device because BXVGA device inherits from block device, 
which inherits from device, which inherits some file. So this is all very C++ y but it is pretty nice. So let's see. So we open that file in the Windows Server main and um, Oh, not in the WS screen constructor, sorry. So we open it and we just assert that we can open it. And then we call FB set buffer, uh, which is an IO cuddle that ends up in the kernel. And this is just um, sort of the device agnostic uh, interface that we have. So you can call um, IO cuddle set buffer on, um, on any type of frame buffer device. So currently, it's only implemented on the, um, this one is only implemented on the box VGA device. And what set buffer does is that it allows you to switch between different buffers. Um, so we can do double buffering. Now we don't have a way to do double buffering with a multi boot device driver because um, we don't know how to do that for every possible card. And um, because of that, the multi boot video driver currently does not do double buffering because we don't know how to page flip. Um, so that's just something that we do on the, um, on the emulated graphics card, but uh, we would like to be able to do it on the multi-boot driver as well in the future. But um, basically what we're doing here is that we are determining would a call to set buffer succeed? If so, we remember that and we remember that we can set the buffer because then we can switch between two different bitmaps immediately on screen to create this sort of tearing free um, updates so that you can like drag a window around and you don't get screen tearing. That's the idea anyway. Um, or you don't get flicker. But we can proceed without it, which we will in the multi-boot case. And then uh, we call set resolution with the passed in uh, width and height. So that will uh, turn into a call to FB set resolution, which is another IO codal. And as I was showing you in the, uh, in the frame buffer, um, or rather in the, in the BXVJ device, it actually turns into a call to set resolution, which sets registers in the, um, in the VGA, uh, in the emulated VGA card. Um, but in the multi-boot VGA device, it just, we just store the values, but we don't do anything with them because we don't know how yet. So this is a fix me. Um, but Leav is actually one of our contributors. He's working on this a little bit at the moment and trying to uh, come up with a way to set the resolution when we're using the multi-boot VGA device. So things happening in that area, um, hopefully soon. Anyways, so let's go back to WS screen. <clears throat> so after we set the resolution, um, either by not doing anything or uh, by uh, poking the registers of the video card, uh, then we just say, okay, now put the cursor in the middle of the screen, because that's a good place to start it. So you'll notice when we boot up, the mouse cursor is in the middle of the screen right here. Uh, that's because of this. And then, um, <clears throat> where are you? Okay, so now we have opened the um, frame buffer device and we have a file descriptor pointing to it, but we're not using it for anything interesting yet. So. Uh, I think that happens in the compositor when we instantiate that. So, uh, 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 or no, is it in the window manager maybe? <laughs> I forget. Let's see. Uh, we memory map FB0 somewhere. The frame buffer FD, you restore that. <coughs> and, oh, it's here. Okay, sorry. So, on change resolution. Oh, I should have looked at that. So when we set resolution, we also call on change resolution. Uh, and on change resolution <coughs> checks if we already had a frame buffer stored from before. So the frame buffer is just uh, like a raw pixel data array. So we always use 32 bit color modes, which means that every pixel is four bytes in memory. It's the red value, the green value, the blue value. And then um, in the case of a screen frame buffer, just a dummy value that's not used. But um, if you're saving a bitmap, then this would be where you put your alpha channel. So, <clears throat> um, but be because of the extreme convenience of the four bytes per pixel memory layout, then we use that for 
the frame buffers as well. And the convenience, of course, is that uh, every pixel is 32 bits, so you can move one pixel at a time with 32-bit instructions. Um, the, um, there are no 24-bit instructions that would let you move one pixel at a time with a single instruction in the same convenient way. So 32 bits uh, per pixel is great, just for code, uh, code conciseness and, and density and whatever. So if we have one saved already, then we unmap it. Uh, but if this is our first time here, then we'll call um, fb get size and bytes, and that will tell us that's another IO cuddle that will tell us how how many bytes is the frame buffer at the moment, uh, and that's something that the kernel knows in the um, VGA device, so it just computes that by multiplying its pitch by its height, and we could probably compute this in user space, but it it seems like we can also just ask the kernel because the kernel knows the real value. And then when we know how many bytes this the frame buffer is, then we memory map it. And um, basically what that does is that, um, I mean, this is a standard Unix memory map call where we pass in the frame buffer FD. So this is dev FD0. We pass that to mmap and we ask it to map, um, I think this is the offset, right? Uh, yeah, 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 the offset. So at offset zero, we um, map this many bytes, so the whole frame buffer, at any address. So we don't want it anywhere specific in memory, just um, take this physical screen and map it somewhere in my address space so that I can use it. And that's what this, this does. And the way this is implemented in the kernel is that if you look in MBPGA device, for instance, it implements the mmap. Uh, mmap is a thing that file has. So if, let's see. So every file subclass can implement mmap. And what you're supposed to do is that you just, um, whatever mmap means to you and your subclass, you create a memory region um, in the process, in the, in the calling process for this um, device, and then you give it back to the caller. And that's all you do. So we implement that here. Uh, for instance, or let's look at the multi-boot one. They're basically the same. So we just create an anonymous virtual memory object, um, and it's for the physical range of the frame buffer address all the way to the end of the frame buffer. And actually, you can see here uh, these two assertions. It's These assertions are just because I haven't implemented um, doing a partial memory map of the frame buffer. So currently you have to map the whole thing, otherwise we'll assert just because we don't currently support mapping anything but the whole thing at once. Um, and then, <coughs> so we create an anonymous, <coughs> excuse me, anonymous virtual memory object wrapping this specific address. And that's the address that we saved from before. We got this provided by the bootloader and we construct a memory region um, which is like memory region is like the per process virtual uh, memory mapping that has some kind of virtual memory object underneath it. But this thing is process in process, a process specific thing. And this one uh, can be global. Like these can be shared, but these ones are per process. <clears throat> so we create this, <coughs> excuse me. And let's look at how that uh, shows up here. So actually, in our case, it would be a BXVJ device because we're running in the emulator. Um, so if we open Windows Server here and we look at the, um, wait, where's the thingy here? Boop. Um, Windows Server, and here's the memory map. And we can see right here is the BXVJ frame buffer. So we end up at this. This is a virtual address, and this is the size of it. So it is, um, I guess, six megabytes or something like that. Um, it's, what is it, 1024 by 768 by four. Oh, uh, hold on, maybe it's, oh, right, right, right. So um, it's times two in this case. So this is part of that um, double buffering that I was talking about. So because we detect that we can do double buffering in when using the BXVGA, then we end up allocating two screen bitmaps rather than one. And um, 
the way that the memory is laid out and when you're using the emulator VGA card is that it's just one big contiguous piece of memory. So instead of allocating the size of the, the screen, we allocate the size of the screen times two because then we have first one screen and then another screen. And then we can do this set buffer call to switch between which screen, uh, which part of memory is the screen that you see on screen, if that makes sense. And that's how um, the double buffering is implemented. That's why it's double the size of 10, 1024 by 768 times four bits per pixel, or four bytes per pixel. So, um, <clears throat> and, and oh yeah, and as you can see here, it's read write. And if we look in open files, we can also see that it's file descriptor nine is the BXVGA device and it's open. Um, and yeah, that's, that's that. So <clears throat> we've successfully memory mapped the thing. And then that means that now, um, let's see, where do we call this? What was it? WS screen, right? So now we store that in M frame buffer and M frame buffer is now available by calling WS screen scan line. And this is the thing that uh, compositor uses. So uh, WS compositor is the um, class in the Windows Server program that takes all the windows and um, composites them, composites, composes, I don't know what the verb is. <laughs> uh, it basically, basically goes uh, from back to front and um, paints them on top of each other so that you get the final screen image. And it has these various optimizations and, and like um, does this culling and stuff to figure out, well, this thing is not visible anyway, so there's no need to, to draw the pixels. And it tries to be efficient by, you know, combining rectangles and, and stuff to do as little work as possible. Still a lot of room for improvement, but it does have some pretty sophisticated optimizations. <clears throat> but anyway, the and, and also it's responsible for drawing the, the desktop um, background. So the compositor is the class that does all that. And um, internally, internally the compositor is always double buffered, even if your video card is not double buffered. So we have a, um, uh, let's see how this works. So we have a front bitmap and a back bitmap <clears throat> in the compositor. And um, we're always drawing um, the current screen. We're, we're always drawing the screen image into the back bitmap. And then when the screen image is completely finished, then we switch it over and copy the back bitmap to the front bitmap. And the front bitmap is what you see on screen. So you can see here the way that we set up the front bitmap is that we create a graphics bitmap object, which is a wrapper around the screen scan line zero. And um, it uses the screen pitch and everything. So this actually doesn't allocate any memory. Instead, it just creates a wrapper around the screen memory. And scan line zero is just the top left, I mean the top scan line on screen. And um, so this thing, this basically creates us a graphics bitmap, which is um, the primitive object in libdraw of Serenity that we know how to draw into and we know how to manipulate. Um, but a graphics bitmap can also be self-allocating. So you see here, if we can set buffer, which means that double buffering is supported by the um, um, device, then we will create a back bitmap that's an offset into the screen bitmap. So you see here, we pick scan line size that height. So basically like at the bottom of the screen, the, the next, um, row below the bottom of the screen, that's the start of the, um, the second screen bitmap in the case where we can do hardware buffer flipping. Um, but otherwise, the back bitmap is just, we just call create a uh, graphics bitmap create, which will do a, um, it will do a new allocation. So we end up here where we just a map asking the kernel, hey, just give me some RAM so I can draw into it. And uh, that's how those are created. And then we create a painter for both the front and the back one. And that's just a, that's just a tiny little optimization to not have to create a painter every time that we want to paint it to them. Um, and then, uh, let's see. So uh, 
this is init bitmaps and who calls that? Is this some kind of init thing? Yeah, yeah, when we construct the compositor, we call init bitmaps. And it also happens, I guess, when we change the resolution. Yeah, here, if you change the resolution of the compositor, then we have to reinitialize the bitmaps uh, so that they are valid. Um, and then, I mean, the compositor is this whole thing to talk about, but basically it uses um, a set of timers to do the drive the comp comp compositing <laughs> um, because we only want to go at maximum 60 times per second. So we have this, we don't have access to the, um, the vertical retrace um, interrupt or the vsync because I don't know yet how to set that up for something like, um, like a generic VGA device. And there's no like generic way to get that as an IRQ or something. Um, maybe there's a way to, to figure this out by, um, I'm not really sure. I, I've been thinking a bit about it. Maybe you could wait for the, um, you can read the V blank signal. Um, you can, you can like busy wait and, and figure out when it's happening, but, um, that'll just give you some cue where it happened once. And then you could, I guess, set up a repeating timer or something that runs at a specific interval and that will interrupt you because um, the v uh, the vsync is predictable. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I would like to to have something where the video card tells me like, hey, now would be a good time to swap the contents on screen because I'm not drawing. But I haven't worked that out yet, what to do. But anyway, when these timers fire, then what we do is we call compose. And whenever uh, whenever you like alter something on screen, like you drag a window around or something, <coughs> um, or anything has to happen on screen, so <coughs> excuse me, uh, when this timer up here ticks, or when this CPU monitor um, moves, um, <coughs> damn, then we get a call to compose. And um, what compose does is that it will work out uh, what are all the um, rectangles on screen that have potentially changed since last time we did a compose. And then it um, goes back to front from the desktop wallpaper all the way up to uh, Windows and on top. And then finally the cursor <coughs> and renders them into the um, back screen bitmap. <coughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> so first thing we do is we just grab all of our cache dirty rects. So during normal operation, we are accumulating dirty rectangles, which happens when you call compositor invalidate. And this is a very common operation that happens whenever you move a window around, for instance, then um, it turns into a call to compositor invalidate with a rectangle. Um, and the compositor just collects these rectangles in this thing called a, a dirty rect, and it's a disjoint rect set, <coughs> which is um, basically like a, it's like a, a collection of rectangles that uh, tries to um, merge together overlapping things, um, and if you it tries to swallow any unnecessary rectangles that you add to it, because ultimately what we want to end up with is um, an upper uh, screen rendering without drawing the same pixel twice. Right, that's the that's the end goal of it. So. That's what this class tries to achieve. You can you can look into it if you're curious. It has it does a little bit of uh, magic to to try to work out like what are all of the rectangles, the unique rectangles in this set of rectangles without any overlap. Um, I'm not sure if this code is perfect. Uh, it's probably not. Could probably be better, but it just loops over the set and works out <clears throat> all of the unique rectangles and gets rid of overlap. So I feel like I said that twice. <laughs> anyway, um, so when we invalidate a rectangle in the compositor, we just add that rectangle to the dirty rects and then schedule um, a compose. Uh, and then when we eventually get to the compose, because you may invalidate things over and over, and it will still only compose at 60 FPS. So if you invalidate the whole screen over and over and over and over, it's not going to draw more. You will just draw uh, once next time we hit a 60 FPS um, synchronization point. 
So <clears throat> first thing we do here is we grab the dirty rights that we have accumulated. And if we have nothing, no dirty rights, then we just let go because there's nothing to do. And then we add some more dirty rights that we have. Um, so for instance, we remember the cursor, where the cursor is now and where the cursor um, was in the previous update so that we can uh, redraw those parts of the screen uh, to make sure that we don't leave like a ghost of the cursor behind anywhere. And <clears throat> we also have special handling of this geometry label, the thing that shows up in the middle of the terminal here. It's called um, geometry label. Um, and it's just to help you when you're resizing something, then the compositor will, will draw this little thing in that window just to help you understand how your resize is going. And we make sure that we redraw those on every compose. So that's probably not maximally efficient. It's just something that I did to avoid ghosting. Um, and then the, um, here is the big compose function. And it's pretty hairy if you are not familiar with this type of stuff, which I wasn't really when I started working on it. So um, <clears throat> some of it is probably quite naive. And this is just a helper. Um, so the first thing we do is we just walk our list of dirty rectangles and then we check if um, any opaque window uh, contains this dirty rectangle then we skip over it uh, because this part here uh, I can tell now is about drawing the wallpaper. So um, like draw wallpaper paint Um, so, like, basically, for all the dirty rectangles that we have, that we want to paint now, um, we figure out, is the wallpaper at all visible in this rectangle of screen? Um, and if a rectangle is covered by a window that is not translucent or transparent in any way, then you cannot see the wallpaper in that rectangle. So, um, we can just skip over this part, but otherwise, the first thing we do is we fill that rectangle with the background color. And then if we have a wallpaper bitmap, here's a room for an optimization here. I can tell right away. No need to fill with color. <clears throat> so we should compute somehow if the wallpaper is opaque somewhere. Um, so first thing we do is we fill that rectangle with the background color. And then if we have a wallpaper, then uh, depending on the wallpaper mode, so it might be like uh, just a simple wallpaper uh, where we just draw it at the top uh, left of the screen, or do we want to center it on screen, or do we want to tile the wallpaper over and over, depending on which one, or finally we scale it. Um, so this should really read this way, otherwise it looks weird that you'd Im like the else being scaled. Like I understand that there's no more wallpaper modes, but still it's much better to spell that out and say, okay. Um, yeah, so here we just draw the wallpaper into each dirty rectangle. Uh, and then comes this big function called compose window. Uh, and it's called down here. So um, we just separate this out into a little function helper object so that we can call it um, depending on if we are in full, full screen mode, then we just have to compose a single full screen window because it um, takes up the whole screen. So then in full screen mode, there's no need to iterate the window stack. But uh, then we just compose one window. But if otherwise, if we're not in full screen mode, then we walk for each visible window from back to front, which is this helper thingy here that walks the um, window stack in order of window type. Um, and it's, it's a big, big template-y thing, but um, it reads very nicely here, I think. So for each visible window from back to front, we call compose window. And compose window is this blob right here. And um, first thing we do, because we walk the whole window stack now. So if any dirty rect in intersects window, if that returns false, that means that there is no dirty rectangle um, that has any intersection with this particular window, so we can just skip over it. That's what we do. Otherwise, we, uh, you see here, we're uh, working with the back painter. That's the painter that draws into the back bitmap, not the bitmap that's visible on screen right now. 
we clip it to this particular Windows uh, frame rectangle, which is the whole rectangle um, enclosing the window. And then uh, we get the graphics bitmap at the backing store for this particular window. So each window has a graphics bitmap that uh, is shared memory bitmap that is shared between the Windows server and the client program. Um, or if it's the Windows server's own bitmap, like the menu bar, for instance, then it's not shared, it's just a graphics bitmap. But we get the graphics bitmap for this window. And then we walk the list of dirty rects that we have. And um, let's see if, uh, oh yeah, yeah, so if any window above this window um, completely contains this particular dirty rectangle, then we can skip over this because there's no need to paint these pixels. A window that's above us will cover all of them anyway. So this is one of those optimizations and you can look into how this thing works and basically it just decides, it looks at the windows above this window and decides like, hey, this one is covered or not covered. Um, and um, that allows us to skip a lot of uh, pixel pushing. Um, and then if we uh, get to the part here where we actually uh, think we might have to paint this, then we clip the back painter to the dirty rectangle. So clipping is, uh, clipping accumulates. So like you clip and then you can only clip smaller. Uh, you can you can like only narrow down the clip. Um, you can reset the clip rect, but when you add to it, then it always shrinks or stays the same. So we're trying to minimize the clip rectangle to the smallest possible area here. So first we were clipped to the window. Now we clip to the window and uh, further down to the dirty rect intersection with that window. And then here, if the window doesn't have a backing store, so we were, we'd got null when we asked for it, then we will just fill the dirty rect with the window's background color, which is uh, whatever the window says his background color is. And that's just, um, it's just a way that we can have something to paint if a window doesn't hasn't um, given us a bitmap yet to be its backing store. And then here, if the window is not full screen, then we will paint the window frame. And the window frame is just the, um, this thing right here, like the whole frame, including the title bar and icon and these buttons and everything. That's the window frame. Um, so if it's a non-full screen window, then we call window frame paint and that's WS window frame and it does all this stuff to draw the title bar and icon and, and whatnot. Um, and we could definitely, we could, this could be optimized because uh, we're not noticing any unnecessary work here, basically. Um, and then at this point, if we don't have a backing store, then there's nothing left to do. So if, if we didn't have a backing store, we've already filled with the background color and we can just skip to the next uh, dirty rect. But if we do have a backing store, then um, we compute the dirty rectangle in the window's own coordinates and translate that by window position and blah, 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 blah. We do a bunch of coordinate translation. Uh, and then basically we just want to figure out the parameters to calling back painter blit with the um, Windows backing store at the right screen location uh, into the destination bitmap um, or the destination position in the backing bitmap. So this is where we actually um, take the window bitmap and carve out the dirty rectangle and, and copy those pixels over to the screen bitmap or to the, the backing bitmap that's going to become the screen bitmap. Um, and then if the backing store happens to be uh, smaller than the, um, the window currently, so like if you're doing a resize, for instance, um, you can see that, let's open something, text editor. So if I'm resizing, you can see that sometimes there's a little bit of black on the edge of the screen there. Um, while I'm resizing, maybe it's not super obvious. Uh, grab some more complex application. Like this one, can we resize this? Okay, this is too fast. <laughs> but you can kind of see. Uh, but anyway, if, if the backing store for this window is not big enough to cover the whole 
window, then we take the remaining area and just fill that with more background color. And we do that um, horizontally and vertically. And that happens after we blitz the um, pixels that we do have from the backing bitmap. And that's it. That's how we draw a window. Dirty rect by dirty rect. And then we, as you saw here, we go the whole window stack from back to front. And then the final thing we do uh, for the window stack is we draw the geometry label if we have one. So if a window is being moved or resized, then um, we draw this little label with um, geometry information. Then now we've dealt with the windows and uh, not much remains. We draw the cursor, which uh, basically uh, we just figure out where's the current cursor rectangle on screen. And um, we, wait, does that thing even work? Inner color, higher color. These things are not doing anything. It, it used to be that, um, it used to be that when you click down the mouse cursor, it would change color, like it would invert. But that was back when I was drawing the cursor manually. Now the cursor is a bitmap, so this stuff here does nothing. Uh, <laughs> So that's good. So we just blit the cursor at the cursor location, basically. The active cursor's bitmap. And cursor management is this whole other thing that we don't have to go into now. But, and then we save what was the last cursor rectangle. And that allows us to make sure that we always update the last cursor rect in the next compose so that we don't leave any ghost of the cursor behind. And then uh, if flash flush is enabled, so flash flush is this thingy where you can um, have the Windows server draw a little yellow before it updates the screen. So maybe we can turn that on. If we just hard code it on, I, I don't really ever use this anymore, but it was something I was using a lot when I was working on Windows server originally, just so I could understand where um, screen updates were happening. So before it, um, copies of dirty rec to the screen, it will flash it with yellow. So for every dirty rectangle, first comes yellow and then gets the actual contents that it's going to have. And it just allows you to see where's the screen update spam happening. Let's see if it still works. I haven't tested this in forever. It used to be that you could turn it on uh, with a, some command line thing. Um, Wait, what did I even want to do? Can we get it to show any yellow? Yeah, so you can see this flashes yellow here, but I think it's a little too fast. We need to slow it down somehow. If I'm doing this, you can see that you can occasionally see the yellow, but oftentimes you don't even see it because it's too fast. Um, but if you have something that like aggressively updates the screen all the time, then that was supposed to help you debug that. But uh, it's so efficient these days. It used to have these kind of issues where like one window would be on top of another and then something like the cursor uh, here would blink and that would cause this window to update. And, like stuff like that is what I wanted to figure out with, with the yellow flash flush. Anyway, let's turn that off. Um, so it's not used normally. And then here comes the, if we can set the buffer, then we flip buffers, which means that we swap the back uh, painter and the front painter and the back bitmap and the front bitmap. And then we tell the um, WS screen to set a different buffer, which turns into a call to F um, set buffer in the kernel, which is only implemented by the BXVJ device. Um, not by the multi-boot one. So this only works in the emulator uh, at the moment. And um, so this is skipped over if it, if we're booting a real hardware or multi-boot device. And finally, uh, here comes the, the part where we take everything that we've now painted into the back bitmap and we copy it over to the front bitmap. And this is where the screen update actually becomes visible on the um, uh, multi-boot device case and um, in the BXVGA case we also want to copy the things over except in that case um, 
if, if we're running with um, page flipping or, or double buffering, then um, it's already visible at this point, the new screen image, but we still copy over the new screen image to the old screen image because uh, we want them to be synchronized so that incremental updates will still um, appear as if they were all in the same image, if that makes sense. So it's just not to lose any changes. But if we're on the multi-boot device, then, then flushing, basically, uh, yeah, you can, here's what I was just saying. <laughs> it depends on we can flip buffers or not. Um, but basically, it's just, we iterate through the, um, each uh, dirty rectangle. And for every dirty rectangle, we copy, um, copy the pixel data from the one bitmap to the other. And that's how we end up seeing the image on screen. So basically, um, we try to only copy the pixels that actually changed between um, composed calls. So um, if you're updating the whole screen, then we have to copy the whole screen. But if you're only um, like changing one line of text, then we probably only do that one line of text. Or if you're only moving the cursor, then we only repaint that little rectangle containing the cursor. Um, there's still room for improvement, but that's essentially how the whole, the whole thing works. Um, yeah, so I guess that was, um, I guess that was my tour. <laughs> uh, I can show you a few more window types. You can see here there are, we have tuple tips and, um, here's the window switcher, which you can use if you press, um, super tab. Then you get this thing which lets you switch between windows. And um, the switcher is like always above other windows, and tooltips are always above things, and menus are always above things, and they have this internal order which is determined by the um, window manager uh, for each visible window from back to front. Like this is the canonical um, authority on the window order. So you can see that. The launcher is the lowest priority in the window stack and the window switcher is the highest. So that's the, um, the super tab window and the menus are the second highest and the menu bar and tooltips and so on. Like, um, so I definitely encourage you to, to go and browse the code that I've shown you and look for yourself. And uh, I hope that this tour has been informative and interesting. Uh, and I hope I was able to shed some light on how the Windows Server stack um, works. There's, of course, there's a lot more to it. Um, I also have a little more high-level overview presentation that I did a while back about how the Windows Server works. Um, some things have changed, but m most of it is still um, accurate. Um, and we didn't get into any of the IPC stuff, any of the menu stuff, um, but... Um, memory and compositing like that's what i wanted to to talk about today so this was my tour of that uh, thank you for checking it out and um please uh, check out the code if you're interested and um, if you have any questions then you can always find me on irc in the serenity os channel on freenode and um uh happy happy hacking i guess <laughs> and have a great day.